Hello again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And the very next is our last speaker. I really, it's really hard to believe we are almost done. Um, it's such an honor to have him here because it's the very, very only talk he'll give this year. Um, and this makes us really proud. Um, he's the inventor of FunCon, Brio, Ool, so many amazing conferences. And I'm really, really proud to have him here. Please give Paul Campbell a warm applause. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you very much, Ole. It is indeed great to be here. It's great to be with you. Um, thank you for coming, and thank you for making So Coded a great success. It's the people that really matter. Um, so I'd just like to start by thanking all of the fantastic speakers that were on yesterday and today. It's been really great. So just give a round of applause for all the speakers. Just before we begin, I'd like everybody to stand up just uh, and put your hands up in the air. You all look like idiots. Don't sit down. Um, Ole, Torben, Sebastian, I want everyone to raise the roof because those guys put this on. It's the first time they've put this conference on. And I just want everybody to tell them how much they appreciate how great a conference it was. So just raise the roof. Okay, you're done. <laughs> Guys, you got a standing ovation. <laughs> All right, we're, we're good to go. The wheels screeched. The grinding crunch of rubber and gravel shot a slow motion chip into my brain. And suddenly I was inside a video game. And the world was in a spin as I looked up through the windscreen. This doesn't happen in real life. When you're inside a car that's flipping after sliding out of control at 50 miles an hour, you don't have any sense of the flip. One moment you're reading a book in the back seat, the next you're hanging from your seatbelt upside down. There isn't even enough time for the blood to rush to your head you expect there to be an impact that will crush your brain and that the lights will go out. Are you okay? I'm okay. Are you okay? I'm okay. Ten years ago, I was in a car crash in Canada with two of my friends. Thankfully, we all survived completely physically unscathed. We were on day six of a 45-day trip. All of our belongings that had been in the car, they were destroyed. Fortunately, between the Canadian Ambulance and Fire Service and the Red Cross, within a few days we were back on our feet. We were lucky enough to be able to call our parents in the middle of what was their night and that day and, and say, Mom and Dad, before I say anything, we're 100% fine, it's fine. But we were in a car crash. That same week, a friend of a friend, Rob, was in a motorcycle accident in Thailand. Our friends at home got two emails within a few days. One was that we'd been in a car crash, but that we were fine. The other email was that Rob had been in a motorcycle accident, and that he was dead. Since then, I've been living on borrowed, stolen time. I cheated the system. I'm not supposed to be here. 
After the crash, we spent a couple of days at a motel at the Red Cross's expense. We bussed back to Quebec City and resumed our holiday. Over the following month, we picked up temporary new passports at the Irish consulate in Ottawa. We drove jet skis in Toronto, donned ponchos and took a ride in Niagara Falls. We visited New York City. We partied long into the night. We drank PBR on the street in Boston. We flew to Florida and surfed Cocoa Beach. Making our way back to Montreal, we finally went home, leaving behind the memory of the trip of a lifetime. Having nearly lost it, life felt so much fuller. I often wonder what it would have been like if I had died. Even as a kid, I always wanted to be different. Not different for its own sake, but different because I like having a full palette. I believed that I could do anything I wanted and that my parents and family propagated this belief. There wasn't a lot of money around, but there was a lot of love and support and encouragement. I grew up oblivious to a lot of the more prevalent prejudices in society, but also oblivious to a lot of personal demons. I was told my biggest problem in life would simply be choosing what I wanted to do. Ultimately, I think I just wanted to delight people. I wanted to put a smile on the faces of the people around me. When I was 16, as many of us folks who were interested in the internet, I got various jobs building websites. And without realizing it, I got into a situation where my belief started to wane. People called me arrogant, cocky. Self-belief began to turn to self-doubt. What followed were about six years of floating. I graduated school, went to college. I did lots of things, but it was, it was mostly just coasting along. And then, I nearly died. Shortly after the crash, I read a book about the founders of Google. It turned out that confidence was one of their hallmarks. People called them arrogant, but they wore confidence like a badge. For them, it wasn't about trying to prove that they were smarter than anybody, which is from where arrogance stems. For them, it wasn't about trying to project a false image of themselves, like charlatans, in order to impress others. For them, it wasn't about being right at any cost. It was about questioning the status quo. It was about questioning their assumptions. And it was about not accepting things being the way that they are. It was about believing that things can be better. I got out of college, finally, with the most critical realization of my life. Personal confidence doesn't come from knowing more or having more information or insight, ability or talent than anyone else. Personal confidence, confidence comes from knowing that nothing is exempt from questioning. After I left college, I decided to start my questioning quite literally at the simplest place I knew, on my own doorstep. At the time, I, along with several others I discovered, believed that the environment in Dublin, for people who wanted to make software, was decidedly underserved. We gave ourselves permission to question the assumptions that seemed to be everywhere. Irish people were incapable of world-class software design, that's what we thought. It was okay to be shitty. Dublin would never be able to compete with places like San Francisco, so we might as well just accept second fiddle. So I decided to go to San Francisco. In Dublin, when I was out with local peers in the tech scene, I felt like I was being judged for who I was. Who are you? What have you done? 
I felt that people were very happy to be spoon-fed technology from outside of the island. I felt like we were happy to take whatever was prescribed from, for, to us from overseas. And I felt that I was either a somebody or a nobody, and that being a nobody was worthless. But in San Francisco, I felt that simply being interested was, being, was enough to be part of the conversation. It was a spirit that I'd been missing at home. An underlying assumption that in every conversation that I was a valuable person simply because I was enthusiastic. So I brought home a determination to change things in Dublin. I didn't have any money, but I did have a will and a spirit that I knew I wanted to share. I founded a company with some of the others who were hungry to make a difference. Not locally, but globally. From a small office in Dublin, we set out to provide world-class service using the best technology we could get our hands on. And with a determination to contribute back whatever we could, we didn't have permission, but we did it anyway. We tried to promote Ireland as a stronghold of excitement, talent, and the very best on the international stage. We promoted ourselves as the freshest, most talented, fastest, friendliest team on the planet, distance from San Francisco be damned. We questioned the assumptions that were floating in the environment that we found ourselves in, and we destroyed their premises by simply ignoring them and producing world-class work despite them. Our software was used all over the world by people that we originally perceived as heroes and later peers. We never accepted shitty as a solution, and Dublin was our back door. We didn't want to leave home. Eventually, I was ready to move on, but we had sown the seeds for better things to come. That same year, I went to two conferences that changed my entire perspective. The first was JSConf in Berlin, and the second was Build in Belfast. I'd been to conferences before, but there was a particular difference with these two, because I knew the organizers. JSConf and Build were my first experience of conferences that put the people first. Your cost of entry got you access to talks by some of the most interesting people in the JS world. They weren't talking about promoting a product or about acting as a conduit into their sponsors' marketing machines. They were about sharing a spirit, a spirit of creativity, of, as Bill put it, building a better web. JS Conf promoted being part of a family. The idea resonated me resonated with me from the moment I realized. These conferences were more effective at bringing to light and in turn value to people's lives. And the people that hosted these events were, in fact, just people. People who I shared drinks with. People with whom I chatted about making a difference. In the beginning, I didn't want to put on FunConf. I didn't have any money, not least any connections. All I wanted to do was to make nice things. Convinced in the end that it was a good idea, I fought to make it different. I wanted it to be special. We can't do something with cloth-back chairs and a hotel meeting room. That was my, my argument. I had been to conferences where I'd fall asleep mid-session. I'd feel lonely and insecure eating crappy lunch at the table beside strangers who I was too nervous to talk to. I had ended up in strange cities with nothing to do, wondering why the conference organizers hadn't organized anything for me. I didn't want anyone thinking the same of any conference that I organized. I wanted the people who came to question the assumptions that they had about what a conference could be. A bus, a castle, an island, helicopters, a train, traditional Irish storytelling. Those were just the results. The key was that we wanted to take ourselves, two lads from Dublin, and the spirit of sharing time with us for pints or for coffee or just simple conversation and amplify that. When we were done with the first, we wanted to question even more assumptions. 
Surely you can't book a castle. When we were done with that, and we tried to dial crazy up another notch, flying people to an island with helicopters, it turned out that arranging these things were the most simple to arrange. Just because nobody had done it before didn't mean that it, it wasn't easy. The crazy wasn't the important part. The important part was amplifying what it was like to hang out with us. Two guys who really just wanted to be part of the family who believed in better and who wanted to share that, what, that, share that with the people around them. We wanted to be better. Midway through FunConf, we decided to make it a trilogy. Our careers were diverging, and the pressures to put on an amazing show were immense. It, it just felt right. I decided to use the contacts that I'd made with FunConf to build a new conference. A conference about building great products with my favorite company, Apple, as the benchmark. The result was Ool, an event that I believe is the best thing I've done. With all of these events, it was easy to get distracted from the thing that I'd spent a huge amount of time honing my skills at, building software. Hence, Tito, my ticketing software, was born. Tito has brought me more pain and more satisfaction than any other product that I've been part of. Even though the first line of code was written over two years ago, I feel like the story has barely begun. Tita is about building better software for me. I did not die on that June afternoon 10 years ago. 10 years later, I hope that I have been a responsible steward for the life that was gifted to me. I'm not as successful financially as some people I've met predicted on my behalf. I'm not as patient nor as forgiving as I might be, given that I should appreciate life all the more. I'm not nearly as influential, as well-respected, nor as powerful as I imagine I could have been had I made other decisions in life. But every day, when I consider my life, and my position and the road I'm on, I think to myself, would I like to quit? And the answer is hell no. I try to do the right thing and to act fairly and with integrity in everything that I do. I try to ignore the nagging doubts, the incessant demons, and the constant voice in my head that tells me I'm not good enough. So around this week, about three years ago, I gave a presentation at SchnitzelConf in Austria. It was a wonderful conference with a lineup of really successful entrepreneurs, and they all had a lot of money, and they now run very successful companies. Back then, I felt like a total fraud, because my company, which was just, it had just started, and it was just me and another guy, it had received a lot of attention, but we weren't making a whole lot of money. Today, I, I, I still feel like a fraud. But Back then, I spoke about my wants and loves and hates and my fears, and I still have all of those. Back then, I thought I was on a great path with what I was doing, but things gradually fell apart, and it didn't really work out, and I had to start again. I hope it doesn't happen again. But the premise of that talk, and I still believe it, was that the opportunities today that we have, that wealth would have got us in the past, having wealth in the past, the people who had that were far less powerful than the people who have much lesser wealth relatively today. The access to information, access to a wide variety of opinions and writings and teachings and systems and processes, it's power that the wealthy of the past, they could only ever have dreamt of attaining all of this power. But it's obviously a double-edged sword. How do you decide who to listen to? What voice do you decide and how to filter out the good and the bad? 
How do you distinguish between shitty stuff and okay stuff and good stuff and better and best? Because we use these terms all the time. I think, for now, we don't. There are a lot of unhappy people in the world, and many people search for happiness through what they do, through who they spend time with, through their passions. So I found that my happiness in and of itself is, is necessarily changing all the time, because the happiness itself is, is kind of meaningless. And so for me, I've decided to stop looking for happiness to replace unhappiness, and instead to try just accepting things. You are floating through inconceivable space on a giant rock filled with molten lava. And yet, you subconsciously accept that as fact as normal every day. Everything you do, say, or create, or make is temporary. Every opinion you hold, every fact you pride in knowing, every love you feel, every detail you identify, it'll someday cease to exist. On the face of it, that's, that's a pretty depressing thought. No amount of happiness can combat that. So the only strategy I've found is to accept it. It's true for me as much as it is for you, and learning to accept this has freed me from fear to challenge anything. So what does matter? True arrogance is resting on the laurels of the status quo, settling for things as they have been simply because they always have been that way. That's far more arrogant than having the belief that things always have to say the same, or do not have to say the same. And knowing that you can mold the world into a vision that you consider to be better is all you need to be able to do it. Hell, I hereby grant you the permission to go out and do that, but you don't need permission. Ultimately, everything you do will be destroyed, whether you like it or not. That can either hold you back or it can empower you to make the now all the more present. Sorry. Three weeks from now, I'll just have turned 30. If I look back at the last 10 years, I'll define my outlook as searching for the best things in life. By some measures, I've experienced many of them. I've sought out the best food, the best drink, the best coffee. I've searched out for the best people, and I've used the best software and the best hardware I could possibly find. I've gone to the most beautiful corners of the earth, and I've visited the highest-ranked cities. But here's the thing. Sometimes the best-ranked and the highest-rated and the consensual best isn't, isn't always right. Sometimes inferior is better. Sometimes different is better. Sometimes shittier is better. I've learned that there's no best, there's simply different. The best for you is not necessarily the best for me, and the best for now is not necessarily the best for tomorrow. For the next decade of my life, I hope to define myself by acceptance. Acceptance that I am not better than anyone else, nor am I worse. Acceptance that what is may continue to be, and what is may not be, whether I make it so or not. I plan to listen to other opinions and gather information, and always try to keep up with the conversation. But I vow not to let the conversation distract me from what matters to me. What matters is that, in my mind, I allow others to be as they are, that I afford others that gift, the gift that they too can affect the world, and that they too have permission to go out and make things better. What matters not is that there's shit or okay or good or better and best, but that any one of us can define what each of those things means to us, free from prejudices. So that's where I'm at. These are the tools that I'm using to plan the next stage of my life. First, acceptance of the human condition. 
acceptance that everything I create will sometime be obliterated. That gives me control. Because once I accept that it's going to happen, I can build with that in mind. Second, permission to myself to question everything. Because even if I can't change something, knowing that I never have to accept the status quo gives me freedom of mind, and I can build knowing that I have that power. Finally, better for me is not always better for you. And better for now is not necessarily better for tomorrow. But that's okay, too. And all of this is a, it's a big challenge. And sometimes it's hard to remember, and sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed by life and the universe and everything. But I say, challenge accepted. <laughs>